different order this morning. Sometimes the Holy Spirit leads that, and it's okay. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to have our prayer, prayer time after our time in the Word, and that's something the Lord spoke to my heart this week about because of what God's put on my heart to share. Let me ask you, if you would, before we forget, if you would go ahead and take those baskets and pass those uh, to the outer uh, parts there. Uh, Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Uh, super job. The said carries away, and so uh, he's going to continue his series when he returns, but uh, he'd asked me to preach, and so I've been praying about that and excited to be back with you and to, uh, to share what God's put on my heart. Uh, probably my, the most fascinating place on earth for me, a place I've never been, but would love to if I were about 30 years younger would be the summit of Mount Everest I don't know what it is about Mount Everest Mount Everest absolutely fascinates me I went through a time where every show I could find uh, whether it be on YouTube or whether it be on uh, Netflix or whatever about Mount Everest I was watching it and my kids will say yes and he finally got through them all because every night was me watching a Mount Everest show I don't know what it is about Mount Everest it absolutely fascinates me um, I would personally at this point in my life not climb it in a million years there's just no way I would do that um, and I have a lot of respect for those who would attempt it and just out of curiosity just by raise of hand how many of you would try to climb it if you had the chance I know Kyle Reno would. Who else? Who else? Who over here? I saw a couple of hands there. Okay. All right. So most of you are like me. Maybe appreciate it from afar. All right. It's, it's a daunting thing, obviously. It's obviously located in Nepal. It's the highest point on earth. It's the highest point on the planet. 29,029 feet. Can you imagine? If you've ever been flying uh, in a, you know, commercial plane, a, a regular plane going somewhere, you fly at about 30,000 feet. So you think about climbing to almost the altitude that you fly. It, it fascinates me that people do it. Let me give you some things I've learned on if you decide to go climb it, some things I've learned, okay, by watching all the shows that I've watched. All right. Most people who climb Mount Everest take the south route because it's considered the safest for scaling. The north route is a little trickier, and so most people go the south route. And, and so let me tell you about the south route. There are four camps from the base to the summit that climbers make their way up from camp to camp, and the first camp is called base camp. Base camp is at an altitude of 17,598 feet. Now that right there is something that you have to get used to because once you get to base camp then you have to start getting used to the fact that um, you know the air is much thinner and you have to climatize yourself and acclimate yourself to the breathing but base camp is the place where um, the support staff stay because they have a ton of people that come in every year and, and it's becoming more and more popular to try it and so you've got the support staff what are called the Sherpas which are the the native um, uh, folks there from Nepal that help the folks up the mountain and and do all the work there they take care of the needs of the climbers it's also at base camp where folks begin to acclimate to to the breathing now between the first camp the base camp and the second camp is what's called the Kumbu icefall now this is a large treacherous field of ice and crevasses deep uh, imposing scary uh, it's amazing because they will literally just throw a ladder across it and just walk and I'm just like no way ain't no way that, that's just crazy and and but wow I'm impressed because that's what they do they just I mean just ladders that you would use to climb on your roof of your house I mean it's just amazing what they do so there's this large treacherous treacherous field of ice and the thing about this, the Kumbu Icefall, is that it, it warms up and then it re you know, it, it'll refreeze and it'll shift in the process. So you've got 
um, you know, these crevices, you've got this field of ice, it shifts, it melts, it reforms, it's a little scary, it's a little shaky. Once you get to the second camp, it's just about 2,000 feet higher than base camp, it's 19,685 feet. Then you go to the third camp, which is at 21,000 feet. Now to get to it, climbers have to ascend what is called the Lotse Face. The Lotse Face is a steep, shiny wall of solid ice that essentially goes straight up. So you have to climb straight up this sheet of ice to get up the Lotse Face. And as you climb it, you get to the fourth camp, which is at 26,085 feet. And it's located in what is called the death zone. Doesn't that sound exciting? Yeah, let's go to the death zone. Now, the reason they call it the death zone is because what you have to do when you go from base camp to the second camp to the third camp to the fourth camp, the Sherpas, who are the, the natives there, who, who the native Nepalese, I don't know, if you, what do you call people from Nepal? Is it Nepalese? I'm guessing here, so just bear with me. All right, the native folks from Nepal, who are the Sherpas, they're, they're, they're used to this. They, they were born in this weather. They were born in this climate. They, they do their thing. But those of us from the West or different places that might go, you have to get used to the air being so thin and you're not able to breathe and you're, you're using oxygen, obviously, as you're climbing a lot. And you go up and you kind of get used to it and then they'll bring you back down for a couple of days to the, to the camp prior to the one that you're at. So if you're at, at two, you go to three, you stay a couple of days, you come back down, then you go back up and you're just getting used to the breathing. And then they finally get you to the fourth camp and the fourth camp is again in what's called the death zone. Now, they call it the death zone because it is so high that at that point, the body actually starts to feed on itself. You're in the process of dying at that altitude. And so you only have a certain amount of time to get to, uh, and I'm not sure exactly how much it is, it's like a couple of days, and of course you're using oxygen, but you only have a certain amount of time to get to the summit and back down. As you leave the fourth camp to go to the summit, you, the next step is what's called the Hillary step. The Hillary step is named after Sir Edmund Hillary, who he and his Sherpa were the first ones to ever climb Mount Everest successfully. And so it's named after him. Now, this is a really tight area. The, the Hillary step is a tight area where only one climber at a time can climb. And this is where there are a lot of bottlenecks. And with now, with so many people climbing Everest, it's, it's dangerous because they'll have a line of people waiting to climb the Hillary step, and they're in the death zone, and their oxygen is being used up, and they've got to get up there and get back down. So when you hear about deaths that take place on Mount Everest, it's usually not going up, it's coming down. Because what they did, they've, they've waited so long to get to the Hillary step and then get up to the summit that then they've got to kind of beat the clock on their oxygen tanks to get back down the mountain. The last step is that climb from the Hillary step to the summit. And at the summit, you need to get down as soon as possible. They usually don't let you stay too long. They want you to see it, take some pictures, 30 minutes, get back down because you, you want to live. You want to live to tell about it. Probably the main reason so many people die, as I said, is because it gets crowded at the Hillary step they get to the summit, they run out of oxygen before they get back to camp. So I was praying about what to preach this week, and the Lord brought this whole thing to mind. And honestly, I thought, Lord, what, what does my fascination with uh, Everest and, and all that process of getting up and down, what does that have to do with anything that you might be saying to me? And I sensed the Lord put this on my heart. The people climbing Mount Everest are trying with all their might to get to the summit and out of the death zone. To get to the summit of following Jesus, you have to be willing to climb and stay in the death zone. So with that in mind, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 8. And I want us to talk this morning about living in the death zone. And the fact that walking with Jesus can be compared to living in the death zone. 
Mark chapter 8. A couple of verses that Jesus gives us. Verses 34 and 35. And you, you'll know this passage well because this is where Peter confesses Christ. It's also where Peter tells Jesus not to go to Jerusalem, not to go to the cross. And Jesus has just rebuked Peter. I mean, can you imagine, you know, Jesus is telling, oh, wait, they're in you know, Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus looks at his disciples, and that was an interesting and actually intentional place for him to ask the question that he asked because Caesarea Philippi was full of false worship. You had uh, Greek gods and goddesses. You had a lot of paganism going on in Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus is surrounded by all this. You actually had also what was the, the cult worship of the, God, uh, of, of the Romans, which is Caesar. And <clears throat> Jesus is surrounded by all this. And he looks at his disciples and he says, So who do men say that I am? And, of course, they say, Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're, you know, different prophets. And Jesus looks and says, who do you say that I am? And they're all kind of standing there. And then Peter steps up. It was his, one of his shining moments. And he steps up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looks at him and says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for you, heaven and earth has revealed this truth to you. And then he tells him about the cross and going to Jerusalem. And then Peter says, forbid it, Lord never lord you know those two words no lord don't go together because if he's lord you can't say no and the moment you say no well then you've become your own lord and so peter goes from this great moment of you are the christ the son of the living god to saying no that's not going to happen and jesus looks at him and says get thee behind me satan you're talking about your will peter not my father's will and so listen to what he says in verse 34 and he summoned the crowd with his disciples. He said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. So Father, as we look at your word this morning, help us to understand what it means to live in the death zone. Help us to understand that, Lord, when we embrace the death of self and we embrace your life in us, that then and only then will we fully experience all that you have for us. Lord, help us to get out of our own way this morning. And we pray that you would be glorified in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. The great German pastor, theologian, martyr, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you may know him from World War II history. He was a German pastor who was a part of a conspiracy to try to uh, take out Hitler. He died as a result of that. One of the most classic lines that he wrote was this. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. At the heart of that statement, at the heart of Jesus' statement here in Mark, is the dual challenge for each of us to die to self and live to Christ. Quite honestly, many of us as Christians want the latter without the former. We want to live for Christ. We're just not real wild about this idea of dying to self. Many sermons that you'll hear have more to do with living for Christ but rarely touch dying to self. But these things are not to be separated. They are the two sides of the same coin. Is a quarter heads or is it tails? Yes. Is the Christian life dying to self or living to Christ? Yes. Because they, they go together. They're intertwined. And most of us, quite frankly, simply put, need to understand that the first one leads to the possibility of the second one. When you and I determine that death to self is something that we need to embrace, then the second one truly becomes possible. Then letting Christ live through us becomes a, can become a reality. And simply put, you, will, you and I will never experience the life that Christ has for us 
until we recognize the importance of dying to self. Now, this is not a message that's very popular in our culture because we want Christianity to be all about me. So much of Christianity in American culture is actually very humanistic. It's very me-centered. That's why I appreciate the songs we sing are about Him. Many times in the culture that we live in, even some of our Christian songs can be more focused on me than they are the Lord. And so we tend to make it about us. The fact is, is that we are oftentimes our own worst enemy. Would you agree with that? I know without a doubt. My own worst, men, my own worst enemy is me. And we get in the way, we get in our own way more than anything else when it comes to living the Christian life. So what does Jesus say to us in these verses about dying to self? And again, I call this message living in the death zone. First of all, as we look at this passage in Mark, there's something very important that I want to point out regarding how to interpret Scripture. This is so vital because we're not allowed to interpret God's Word any way we want to. We're not allowed to interpret it according to what makes us feel good. We're not uh, allowed to uh, interpret it according to what you know, suits our fancy. That will always lead to misunderstanding and ultimately, dangerously, it will lead to false doctrine. We have to approach the Bible responsibly. And so we have to understand that the Bible, uh, when the Bible talks about, when Jesus talks about those who would follow him, he uses the word, he uses several words, but two of the main words he uses is he uses the, uh, the word, the disciple. He calls those who follow him disciples. He also tells us, to believe in him now when jesus says to believe on him actually in the greek many times it's to believe uh, to believe in him is to believe on him and and there's a difference between simply believing in him like we think of because there are many people who believe in jesus and you ask most I would say most lost people would say yeah i believe in jesus i believe he was a historical figure and yes i believe and some will even say oddly enough Yes, I believe he's the Son of God. But are they saved? Not necessarily. Because you can believe in Jesus as the Son of God, yet not believe on him as your Savior. Somebody say, yeah, I believe he was the Son of God. Have you put your faith and trust in him? Well, no, I hadn't done that. Okay, that's what is saving faith. Not mental assent to some theological truths or some historical realities but trust resolute trust to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus tells us that if we believe in him that we will have eternal life that he is the resurrection and the life and and the one who believes in him has life all right you read those through the epistles and the entire New Testament so we have to understand that the Bible talks about those who are believers. It also talks about those who are disciples. Now, I'm of the mind, as I study Scripture, that the word disciple and the word believer are not necessarily the same thing. The word disciple in the original Greek language means learner. Jesus used it to describe someone who belongs to him, yes, but is learning and growing in their relationship with him. All right? He refers, in fact, in this, in this passage, if you look in uh, verse 34, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must, be, or he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In other gospels, it says, if any, Jesus says, if anyone would be my disciple... So what he's saying is, listen, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my learner, if you want to learn from me, then there's some things you're going to have to do. As I look in the New Testament, it seems clear to me that a genuine believer is someone who believes in his or her heart, not just head belief, as we said, that Jesus is the Son of God who has died for their sins, rose from the dead, to give them salvation they've repented of their sins they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord 
And then a disciple is a step further in the relationship with the genuine believer who has committed himself to following and learning from Jesus in all things. So, I want you to think of yourself in this regard because I want want you to ask yourself the question this morning. First of all, have you been genuinely saved? Do you know that you know that you know? Because if you're 99% sure, you may be 100% lost. And God doesn't want you to leave here this morning without knowing. He wants you to know. All right, so... Every one of us need to come to Christ. If you've come to Christ, you've genuinely given Jesus your life, here's the question I want you to ask yourself. Am I a disciple of Christ? That is, am I learning? Am I following after him? Let me give you some things to consider as you ask yourself that question. Every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is a disciple. Now I want you to think about this, because maybe that you say, wait a minute, I'm not real sure about it. Okay, that's cool. Stick with me. Let's talk through it. All Christians should be committed and growing disciples, but not all are. We know that by practical experience. Some have placed their faith in Christ as Savior and Lord and are on their way to becoming more dedicated disciples. No doubt, we can apply it to ourselves. Many of us, hopefully all of us, follow the Lord more closely now than you did in the years when you first accepted Christ. I can tell you that I was saved, I know I was saved without a doubt, December 25th, 1977, First Baptist Church, Eden, North Carolina. I know I was saved there. I'm much closer to Jesus right now than I was then. I'm much more of a disciple of Him right now than I was at that point. I mean, I can remember when I accepted Christ, I remember the pastor gave me a book. I kind of, I think I've shared this maybe with you before. He gave me a little book called Now That You're a Church Member. Still hadn't read it. (laughs) It's on my shelf in my office. I saved it. The date's in it. It Tells me when I got saved. Here's the thing. I was a nine-year-old kid. I I didn't need a a, a book. I needed a mentor. I needed needed someone to help me along. And and not that books, I, I love books, goodness. But My point is, you can be saved and still have really no idea about what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And that's part of the growth process. So, again, all disciples are believers, but not all believers are disciples. They should be, and you will be, as the Holy Spirit continues to work in your life. So what happens is the Holy Spirit convicts you of your need for Jesus. You come to Christ in salvation, and then he begins to really work on you. Say, okay, now I want to draw you even closer, and I want you to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I look at this passage in Mark, it gives us evidence of this fact. Because Jesus is talking to his disciples But it also seems to indicate that others are around and they're hearing him, but he's talking primarily to the 12. They're they're basically getting to listen in on the conversation. The 12 are the primary focus. You can tell that from the passage. But it also tells us that others were around there. He says in verse 34, he summoned the crowd with his disciples. So he's talking primarily to Peter. Others are standing around listening. And he's giving them the requirements for those who want to follow him as a learner and not just a believer. He gives them three conditions for what it means to truly follow him as a disciple. And these are the three conditions that I call living in the death zone. I want you to see the first one. What does Jesus say? If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. There's the first one. There's the first condition of living in the death zone. That you and I deny ourselves. The word deny, literally in the Greek, is a powerful word. It means to destroy. And that, when I think of destroy, I think of obliterate, annihilate, no more. Destroy, total destruction. Not just kind of wound a little bit, not just kind of injure a little bit. No, total destruction, total annihilation. He says, you must be willing to do that if you will be my disciple. 
What is it that we're destroying? The self, the flesh. What he means here is not that we're to hurt ourselves physically or to abuse ourselves emotionally, but to abandon every self-interest and every personal earthly desire for him. That's not a real popular message, to be honest. Because you think, well, now, preacher, if you preach that stuff, folks are going to run from that. Because, man, they, you know, we just want a little bit of Jesus in the back pocket. That's what we want. I just want enough to get me into heaven. I don't want all that stuff. You know, I still want to do what I want to do the way I want to do it. Amen? I mean, that's, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He said, if you be my disciple, you must deny yourself. Now that goes deep, doesn't it? Because what he's talking about here, very minimum, he's saying, I must be first priority over everything. That is, Jesus is saying, I must be first priority over your agenda. I must be first priority over your opinions. I must be first priority over your personal desires and dreams. I must be personal, uh, first priority over your self-interest and your self-promotion and your self-confidence and anything that is in the way and causing you to live for self. It must be laid to the side if you would be my disciple. That is, are we willing to tell Jesus, Lord, I have no opinions but yours. I have no agenda but yours. I have no goals but yours. I give you my habits. Take them. I give you everything. Ask yourself this. What am I doing in my life that is motivated by a refusal to deny self? What are you doing? What are you saying? How are you acting? What are you thinking? What, what part of your life is made up by that little desire? Just, just, I just want this. I just want this. I just want, I, I love you, Jesus, but I want to dictate how I spend my money. Lord, I love you, but I want to dictate how I spend my time or, or what I buy or, or where I go or how I talk. I love you, but I got this. That's not how Jesus works. And Jesus doesn't make deals with us. He just doesn't. He's Lord. Then he doesn't make deals. So, for instance, when we say, well, you know, I know the Bible talks about giving, but I give my time. I'm going to trade out time for money. Is that okay, Jesus? He says, no, I'm in charge of the wallet, too. In fact, I got the watch, your time, and I got the wallet, don't I? Oh, are you not? Did you miss the part about deny yourself? And I'll hear people talking about giving. People say, well, and I've had it asked of me before. Well, pastor, I mean, do we, do we, okay, so we give. Okay, the Bible says it and we should do it. But do we give based off net or gross? Easy answer. I just say, what do you want God to bless? <laughs> what do you want God to bless? So whether it's time, money, whatever, dreams, goals, agenda, he wants it all. He says, deny yourself. The way you talk to other people, the way you talk to your spouse, the way you talk to your kids, the way you treat your parents, the way you act toward your coworkers, he says, give me that. The way you think about others, the way you think about other races and people different from you. God says, give me that. If you're going to be my disciple, you've got to have my mind on this. You've got to be willing to put down what you think. The way you serve in the body, you know. I, I, I've, heard, I've actually heard this in churches that I've served where we'll go to somebody and say, hey, we really need somebody for this ministry. I think you would fit well. Now, listen, they need to pray about it. I, I don't deny that. But I've had people say, well, pastor, let me pray about that. You know what that means? I'll tell you no later. That's what that means. Or they'll say this, and this is the worst one. They'll say, you know, especially when it comes to children's ministry, okay? 
Because everybody scatters like roaches when the light comes on when we need children's workers. I don't, she didn't see me, did she? That kind of thing. And here's what I've actually heard people say to me, well, pastor, I've done my time. It's not a prison sentence. You're telling people about your kids about Jesus. What could be more important? Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. What could be more important? I know I've done my time. You know, that kind of thing. Okay, I mean, if God doesn't want you to do it, don't do it. But did you even ask him? <laughs> Are you willing to deny yourself? Are you willing to submit all those things to Jesus and let him change them? You know what I have found about me? I have found that I'm pretty good at justifying what I want to do or what I don't want to do. And I'm so good at it that I can even spiritualize it. Anybody else amen that? I can do that. I can spiritualize it. Well, no, Lord, I don't really think you know. And God said, no, actually, you never asked me. You just kind of decided to do it yourself. What I'm not so good at sometimes is denying what I want and asking God what he wants. And one of the things I've learned from watching the documentaries on Mount Everest is that it's pretty nice at base camp. Yeah, it's cold. Yeah, the altitude requires a little getting used to, but you don't need to be on oxygen. You've got pretty much all the creature comforts, all the things you need. There's plenty of food. The Sherpas take care of you. They, give, they assist you with everything. And someone could get so comfortable at base camp that they never try to summit because it demands so much. And I'm sitting there watching that. I'm thinking, I see the church there. We've gotten used to base camp. And I think back to remember, remember when Moses and Joshua and it went up on the mountain and they just they went so far. And what did the people say? No, y'all go on. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> we don't, no, we'll, we'll stay here and, and, and y'all just go up. And so Moses goes up and he, he goes so high. And of course, they different levels some of the men stay and then Joshua stays and then Moses goes all the way to the top and of course receives the Ten Commandments and in the meantime the people who aren't paying attention to what God's doing now they're forming their own calf they got comfortable so more to life can I ask in love what calves idols might we have formed at base camp because we were not wanting to go to the summit because we're comfortable. What idols have you formed in your life at base camp? Because you kind of, you know, when you first got saved, man, I'm going to the top. I am going to the top. I'm going to live at the top. That's going to be incredible. I'm, I am excited about this. This is awesome. And then you kind of got used to things. You said, no, y'all go on to the top. I'm, I'm good right here. That, that requires too much work and oxygen and stuff like that. Jesus says, deny yourself. Let me give you a second thing. Jesus says, you deny yourself, and then you take up your cross. By taking up your cross, you're determining to live a crucified life. I want you to turn with me real quick to Romans, Romans chapter 6. I want you to see something. I want you to understand something about the crucified life. <clears throat> there is a then-now aspect of the crucified life. The then aspect is when you got saved, you were crucified with Christ. So there is a past tense aspect. In fact, it's, it's an already done deal that now God calls us to live in. All right. So when you look at Romans 6, and I'll read it here because I have a different version. He says, this is Paul. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Because there were some people saying, now wait a minute, Paul, you're preaching all this grace. And if grace, if God works by virtue of grace and he pours out, then wouldn't if we sin more, he'd show more grace? You know, they're trying to find some loopholes in the thing and justify what they're doing. So if I'm sinning more and God shows more grace, the more I sin, shouldn't I sin more? And Paul answers the question, by saying, by no means. Other versions say, God forbid. He says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Now, what's the English majors? What's the tense of the word died? Past tense. It's something that happened. Paul says, how can we who died 
still live in that sin. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized, again, tense is important here, past tense, we were baptized into His death. So the moment you got saved, you died with Christ on the cross. You say, well, how did that happen? I'm not 2,000 years old. No, but God's above time. So that when you came into Christ, His death became your death. And you died with Him. That's why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, For I have been crucified with Christ. He's speaking of His death. Nevertheless, he says, I live. All right, well, how does that happen? Because not only was His death your death, His crucifixion was your crucifixion, but His resurrection was your resurrection. And because you're in Him, when He rose from the dead, you rose from the dead in Him. And now, I like to say it this way, now you have somebody in you that's not you, but you think it's you, and it's not, it's Him. Amen? Yeah, I'll say it again. (laughs) You've got somebody in you that you think is you, but it's not you, it's Him. Because he's taken up residence in you. And now Paul says in Galatians 2.20 that the life you now live in the flesh, that is the body. He's talking about the physical body. The life, the life you now live in the physical body, the flesh. You live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. So the Christian's life is the life of Christ in us. That's why Paul says Christ in you, the hope of glory in Colossians. So do, do we not see that the essence of letting Christ live His life in and through us is that we must recognize what has already happened? Because if you take a look at chapter 6, same chapter, verse 11, look what he says here that we're to do. Even so, he says, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So what is he saying? In, In some versions it says, reckon yourself dead. Now, that's not a North Carolina reckon. Back home in North Carolina, we say reckon. He says, hey, you want to go down and get some barbecue and a cheer wine? I reckon. Let's do it. It's not that kind of reckon. It's a reckon that says it's done, and I resolutely trust in it. So what Paul is saying here is this. When you came to Christ, you died. So trust that and live out of that. Reckon yourself. Consider yourself dead. That's the then aspect It was done, you've been baptized into Christ, you were crucified with Him, you have died with Christ, but there's a now aspect that says because that is true, keep reminding yourself of it. So, when someone pulls out in front of you on 441, and you want to horn cuss, you say, no, I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. You say, Paul, have you mastered that? Oh, far from it. But I'm still responsible. So when something happens and somebody says something and you want, and if you're like me, I got, you know, I got, I got comebacks. I got comebacks. And, and I want to, mm. Lord, I'm dead to that. Here's what I've learned. Dead people can never be offended I've never been to a funeral where the corpse got offended when we get offended it's because we get in our own way but when we say "Uh -uh, I'm dead to that Lord Jesus you live through me you're going to respond in a whole different way aren't you so when you look at let me give you one other verse in Galatians 5 24 Paul says Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what what Jesus is telling us is to deny ourselves and take up our cross. And here's what we need to understand about taking up our cross. We're dead to self and therefore we resolutely trust in what's already happened and we live out what's already true. And when we take up our cross, we're willing to sacrifice whatever we need to to follow Jesus. So even to the point of ridicule or death. One scholar says it this way. He says, Rome, the Roman occupied Palestine brought to mind the sight of a condemned man who was forced to demonstrate his submission to Rome by carrying part of his cross through the city to his place of execution. 
Thus, to take up one's cross was to demonstrate publicly one's submission and obedience to the authority against which he had previously rebelled. And so what that's telling us is this. To take up our cross is to submit ourselves to the one whom against we previously rebelled, which is God. And in denying ourselves, we're surrendering everything to God. And in taking up our cross, we're gladly accepting every ounce of ridicule and sacrifice that might result in. So then, guess what? When you take up your cross, you're not worried about what people think anymore. It's okay. Whatever they say, <laughs> you don't care. Now, I'm not saying you don't care about them. But you care more about what God knows than what people think. And you say, Lord, whatever comes, I trust you. Whatever you bring, I trust you. That's taking up the cross. I'm taking up the cross. I'm dying to myself. Lord, wherever you want to lead me is where I'll go. And then finally, he says, the third thing is follow him. And that's where you simply, every day, you say, Lord, not my will, your will. What does it mean to follow him? It's to follow him daily. It's to stay in the death zone. So the call this morning is twofold. Actually threefold, I suppose. Number one, if you don't know Jesus, is to put your faith and trust in him. Number two, if you know him and you're a believer, will you this morning be a disciple? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask our musicians to come. And I want us to pray. This is where we're at time of prayer. And I, I want to ask us, will we come to this altar and say, Lord, I want to be a disciple in a way I've never been before. I want to be your disciple. I want to come. I, I, I want to grow out of base camp. I want to head toward the summit. And so, Lord, this morning I come and I want to deny myself. Maybe there's some specific things you need to deny. You've held on to long enough and the Lord says, give me that. And you need to deny those things and you need to take up your cross. Maybe some of you, have, you're bearing a cross and you're saying, why am I going through this? And because God's saying, because I want you to know me more. And you need to come and thank Him for the difficulty. Thank Him for the ridicule. Thank Him for the persecution. Thank Him because, listen, if you've got it going on, He's counted you worthy to have it. Because He wants to do something. And then come and say, I'll follow you. So will you come? I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. And if you, come, if, you will, if you want to, come to this altar. If God's calling you to this altar, to come and let's pray. And let's say, Lord, I want to be your disciple like never before. It's not enough to be saved. That's wonderful. That's a great start. But Jesus is calling disciples. Oh, that we would be a church full of disciples. Full of those who would deny ourselves. What is it that Jesus has put on your heart this morning that he wants you to deny, that he wants you to give up? That he says, I want to change your mind about that. I want to change your way about that. I want to change your habit about that. I want you to embrace my way. I want you to embrace my mind. I want you to deny yourself in this. Because in denying yourself, Jesus also talks about another passage. That when you deny yourself, when that seed falls to the ground and dies, that's when out from that seed grows what was always intended. So when you and I come to Christ and deny ourselves, that begins the process of His life growing out of you. You're actually unlocking the door in your death. You are actually unlocking the door to your life in Him. So what is it that you need to give Him this morning? 
And then maybe he wants you to take up his cross in some way. Maybe you already know what it is. Now, if you don't, ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, how do you want me to take up the cross of Jesus? And when he's revealed it to you, then you say, look, I want to embrace that. Give me the strength to embrace it. Maybe, honestly, you say, I really don't want to embrace that, but I want to embrace that. Give me the strength to embrace that. I want to embrace your cross. And then will you, will you just throw yourself on the love of the Lord and say, Lord, I want to follow you. Lord Jesus, I want to follow you in everything. I want to speak the words you want me to speak. I want to think the thoughts you want me to think. I want to do the things you want me to do. You must become greater. I must become less. If you need to be saved this morning, then I would encourage you right where you are to confess your sin to Jesus. Tell him. He already knows it, but he wants you to tell him. To just say, Lord, I, I've sinned against you. Confess your sin to Jesus. And put your faith and trust in him today, right now, as Lord and Savior. And if you want someone to come talk to you about that today, we would be more than happy to do that. If there's someone here that needs prayer this morning, we, we don't want him embarrass you anyway but we'd like to pray with you if you need prayer for anything just slip your hand up right now and we've got folks that will come to you and pray with you anybody guys and ladies as we we look around us anybody that needs prayer this morning we want to pray over you before you leave pray with you Let the Holy Spirit have His way. You'll never know the fullness of Jesus' life until you embrace your own death. Most churches are praying that God will send a good revival when really what we need to start with is a good funeral. A good funeral to ourselves. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're, we're in awe of you. Lord Jesus, we see you high and lifted up. Holy Spirit, thank you for pointing us to Christ. We love you, Lord. And I pray that we, those won't just be words in a prayer or lyrics to a song but it will be the, the very essence and heartbeat of our lives to be your disciples, to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow you in everything. And Lord, as we do that, Okeechobee will notice, our families will notice, friends will notice, lost people will notice. Lord, may we be a body full of disciples who love you with our lip and our life, our walk and our talk in every way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Let's close with this song. There's no wall you won't 
And all he chases me now right still I'm found He's not even I And I couldn't earn And I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away And so the overwhelming Never ending Reckless love One more time. Thank you, Lord. love you, Father. Thank you for all you do, Lord. As we go out this week, God, I just ask that you would just soften our hearts. Give us an opportunity to be the light to someone, Lord. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Enjoy!